Well, welcome to uh, the last panel of the day. Um, this being the last panel of the day and everything that stands between us and drinks and dinner, uh, I am going to try and keep within time here. So uh, let's get started. The title of our panel is uh, Does the Originalism of the 14th Amendment Guarantee Justice for All? Uh, our speakers will address the originalist view of the 14th Amendment as applied to basic questions of equality under the law. Uh, and as we all know, uh, originalism has been criticized as trapping us in past prejudice and offering inadequate tools to deal with pressing contemporary issues of inequality. So the general question for our panelists here is, can the 14th Amendment be interpreted in an originalist manner to provide a robust version of equal justice for all, or is its reach more modest? The plan is that each panelist will speak for 10 minutes or so, after which each will have a chance to uh, respond to the others with comments, and then we will open the floor for audience questions. Uh, now I'm going to introduce the panelists briefly in the order in which they will speak. Uh, to my right is Professor Stephen Calabresi uh, of Northwestern Law School. He's an original co-founder of the Federalist Society. Uh, he served in the Reagan and first Bush administrations and now is on the Northwestern faculty where he's published widely in constitutional law. Second is Professor John Harrison, uh, my former colleague at Virginia Law School. Uh, he's recently held the position of legal advisor in the office of the U.S. Department of State, and his areas of expertise are wide and include constitutional history, federal courts, remedies, corporations. Professor Jack Balkin from Yale Law School is the Knight Professor of Constitutional Law in the First Amendment, and he writes in a broad range of fields, including jurisprudence, telecommunications, internet law. His political and legal commentary can be found at the web blog, Balkanization. And finally, Professor Akhil Amar, also of Yale, the Sterling Professor of Law and Political Science, is the author of several books, including most recently, America's Constitution, a biography. So welcome to our panelists, and uh, we will hear from Professor Calabresi. Thank you. We've been asked in this panel to address the question of whether the 14th Amendment guarantees equal justice for, for all. Implicitly, we've been asked, therefore, whether the amendment can be tra interpreted transformatively by the Supreme Court to ban practices that were commonplace in 1868 uh, or to create new constitutional rights that may not have been known at that time. In order to answer this question, I need to address both the way in which the 14th Amendment guarantees equality and the way in which it protects individual rights. My conclusion is that the 14th Amendment is not a license to the Supreme Court with which it can engage in transformational change. Let's begin with the equality guarantee in the amendment. On this point, I agree with my co-panelist, John Harrison, that the 14th Amendment bans all forms of caste-like discrimination. No state is allowed to either to make or enforce any law which abridges the privileges or immunities of one citizen of the United States as compared to another. This command accomplishes the central purpose of the amendment, which was to constitutionalize the Civil Rights Act of 1866 and to ban the black codes. The evil of the Black Codes was that they abridged or shortened or lessened the fundamental rights of a class of people, freed African Americans, by creating a system of racial caste. The 14th Amendment banned all systems of caste, including the racial caste system of the South. But the amendment was not limited, however, to banning only racial caste systems, and would it also have been understood in 1868, in my view, to ban, for example, the Hindu caste system or the reimposition of European feudalism with its division of society into hereditary nobles and serfs. Uh, at a very high level of generality, then, it could accurately be said that the 14th Amendment was intended, was originally meant to guarantee equal justice to, to all. But what does that mean for the role of the Supreme Court 
in interpreting the 14th Amendment. How is the Supreme Court to uh, apply a constitutional ban on systems of caste? The easiest starting point concerns racial caste systems, like the one the Supreme Court held unconstitutional in Brown versus Board of Education. At the time the 14th Amendment was enacted, 36 of the 37 states required in their state constitutions that public schools must be provided to all citizens. The right to a public school education was, for all practical purposes, a privilege or immunity of state citizenship. Congress at the time almost passed, as Michael McConnell has shown, legislation outlawing segregated schools pursuant to Congress's Section 5 power to enforce the 14th Amendment. Such legislation could only have been thought to be constitutional in the 1870s if public school education was thought to be a privilege or immunity. Segregation in schools in 1954 led to an abridgment of the rights, privileges, and immunities of African Americans with respect to public schools as compared to all other Americans. The fact that such segregation had been practiced in 1868 and had been around for a very long time did not change the fact that it was and always had been unconstitutional. And so for this reason, I think the Supreme Court was on solid originalist ground when it struck down segregation in public schools in Brown, even though the court did not recognize that fact in its opinion. In 1967, the Supreme Court in Loving Against Virginia struck down laws banning uh, racial intermarriage, which had been around since 1868 and which had been widely supported in the 1860s and 1870s. Was Loving correctly decided under the originalist approach to constitutional interpretation? The answer again, I think, is clearly yes, because the 14th Amendment had constitutionalized the Civil Rights Act of 1866, and that act had said that African Americans had the same right to make contracts as was enjoyed by white citizens. A white citizen had the right to marry another white citizen, so the 14th Amendment plainly commands that African Americans have that same right. Again, the fact that the framers of the amendment did not understand it this way means nothing. Members of Congress rarely read, much less understand, the laws that they make, and that does not make them any the less binding on all of us. The Supreme Court's use of the 14th Amendment to constrain racial caste in the 1950s and 1960s was right and is therefore, I think, justifiable. Well, what then about the extension of the no caste principle to sex discrimination in, since the 1970s. Is that equally justifiable? Is sexual orientation discrimination also unconstitutional? What about laws that lead to inequalities of wealth or income? The Constitution explicitly addresses the subject of sex discrimination in the 19th Amendment, which was adopted in 1920 and which gave women the right to vote. The right to vote is a political right unlike the civil rights addressed by the 14th Amendment. The framers of the 14th Amendment distinguished between civil rights, which were possessed by all citizens, including women and children, and political rights, which were exercised only by the male subset of the population. It is for this reason that the 15th Amendment was necessary after the 14th to give African American men the right to vote. Once the Constitution had been amended to bar sex discrimination as to political rights, it became utterly implausible to think that the no caste command of the 14th Amendment did not also have some relevance to sex discrimination as to civil rights. Political rights were seen in 1868 as being rarer and more jealously guarded than civil rights. It would make no sense to say, for example, that a woman could vote for president or for Congress, but that they were incapable of making a simple contract without their husband's permission. The Supreme Court recognized as much in 1923 in Adkins against Children's Hospital. The fact that it took 50 years for the court 
to act fully on its wise intuition as to sex discrimination in Adkins says more about the sorry intellectual state of New Deal constitutionalism than it does about the correct application of the 14th Amendment read together with the 19th.